It's amazing how quickly things change. Just a number, a few short years uh, after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and captured the world's attention, especially America, as we all just watched this historic thing take place, Apollo 13, several missions later, came along, and it basically was met with a, uh, a, a unified yawn from the United States. It would become commonplace for space flight and for people to go to travel to the moon. But that all changed when several days into the flight, when going through a routine, as they called, stirring of the oxygen tanks, there was an explosion. And they quickly realized that oxygen was escaping from the part of the ship, and they uh, realized that they needed to get into the lunar landing module, which was much smaller, and shut down the rest of the spaceship. Uh, it was there that as they knew that there would be an approximately 96 hours before they would reach back to Earth, they realized another problem. That being in this small confined space that was designed just for a few hours with one or two people, now all three were going to be in there for an extended, extended period of time. And the carbon monoxide began to build dangerously quick. And they did not have enough filters to change it out enough to make it back to Earth. And so they informed Houston of this problem. And Houston went to work, uh, NASA went to work on how to solve this problem so they would not die of carbon monoxide poisoning in the space flight. And so they assembled a team and they gave them the materials, the exact materials that they would have available on Apollo 13. It was things like a couple of socks, some plastic, a, a box, uh, uh, things like that, a bungee cord, things like that, and said, build a CO2 filter. And they did that, and they told them how to do it, and they fixed it, uh, and they were able to uh, survive and come back. So NASA's greatest failure became the most popular uh, success ever. You know, it's so important that they didn't just have a bunch of engineers design a filter with things they did not have available to them. That would have done them no good to be out in space and not have those things. But they did. You know, we're in our fourth week of our series <clears throat> that we're calling Live Ready. And we live ready because we do not know what's coming tomorrow. We know something's coming tomorrow or the next day or this afternoon, but we don't know what challenges come our way. So we live ready. And the first week we talked about, you know, the first thing is when things happen, don't panic. Don't panic. The first rule of survival is do not panic. And we talked about the second week of just gaining what we call situational awareness. Take stock after you've calmed down. Take stock of what's going on around you, the good and the bad and what's available. And you make a plan. And then last week we talked about having a heart that's ready, who wants to be prepared. As Peter said, be prepared to give an answer. And then this week is just a natural progression of living ready. And we're going to spend all our time in a very, very familiar passage of Scripture uh, that's in Ephesians chapter 6. Now you can turn there in your Bibles. It's going to be on the screen. But we're going to spend just about all of our time in these verses so if you want to turn there to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And Paul says, <clears throat> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And I'm just going to stop right there for just a second. If you go back and you read Ephesians, you, you can tell that it's Paul writing a letter to a group of Christians and basically just telling them how to live as Christians. <clears throat> We've had the Bible. We've had the experience and the, the benefit of having Scripture and other Christian uh, that goes before us to help us learn how to live as a Christian. These were the first Christians. They didn't have anything like that to rely on. So Paul's just writing to them and saying, this is how you handle marriage. This is how you handle raising a family. This is how you handle the workplace. And on like that. So he gets to this place and he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. And it goes on in verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and, you have, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. My first experience probably with making money uh, was when I was probably along 7th or 8th grade, a friend of ours, she was the manager of the Family Dollar Store there in Martinsville. <clears throat> and she asked uh, her brother, who was a good friend of mine and uh, several of us, if we could come to the Family Dollar on a Sunday, closed on Sunday, come on a Sunday afternoon, evening, and help them take inventory. I didn't know what take inventory meant. But we said, they're going to pay us $1.40 an hour. I'm in it. You know, I'm going for it. So we went, and I found out that take inventory meant that they had to go through and count every single thing in the store. And there's no electronics, you know, that you do at that time. So we just had slips of paper, and we, I remember counting every battery in that store. He had to write down the double A's and the triple A's. And I learned then that you take inventory so you'll know what you have. You know what's available to you. And what we need to do in our next step here is we're going to take inventory of what God has made available to us uh, in the armor of God to live ready, to be ready for whatever comes our way. And fortunately for us, God has given us everything we need. Everything we knew, need to live ready. First thing is this. He makes us battle, he gives us battlefield intelligence. We're in a place right now, if you watch the news of anything, anything going on right now, and you see what's going on in Israel, they're gathering information, intelligence, before they go to the next step. And that, that battle, that war that is there. And so you hear that going on, gathering battlefield intelligence. You know, uh, the Bible, oh, we make the mistake of thinking, I have a problem with my boss. I have a problem with my wife. I have a problem with my kids. I have a problem with this, whatever. And we think it's there. But it's always, if not always, it's almost 99.9% .9 deeper than the problem we think it is. And Paul does a good job of going to the source of the problems. It was just this Thursday. Janice and I drove up to visit her sister, spend the night up there in Virginia Beach, and she lives out in a rural part called Pungo. So when you get to Elizabeth City, you're cutting through a lot of crooked country roads to go back through there. And I'm driving along. It's a school bus in front of me. That's not my favorite thing to get behind. I, you know, I just, the school bus stopping every once in a while, you know, all along the way. But I get behind a school bus, and lights start flashing on the bus and everything. So, I, okay, we're making our first stop. But what you, I noticed some parents parked over to the side already where they were stopping. And the bus got a, pulled up and then backed in to like a driveway. Now the flashing lights, stop sign is stuck out on the side of the bus, and that arm that comes out in front of the bus, it's out. So I know to stop. But as I'm sitting there and this is all taking place, the guy behind me blows the horn for me to go. And I'm not talking about a Volkswagen beep, beep. He lays on the horn and stays on the horn for me to go. And Janice says, what's that? I said, the guy wants me to run through this because the bus is backed in. And you can tell they're letting some kids off. And then the bus is going to turn and go back the opposite direction. So I'm going, no way I'm doing he pulls out, goes around me, and goes, and it's a, la a lady standing out in the road, and she's going, no, stop. He just keeps going, and then I read her lips. She goes, 
what is your problem? You know, I just said, and I'm thinking, what's this guy's problem? And he pulls it, he just goes on. The lady looks at me that's trying to stop traffic. She just goes like this. And I went like this. The scary part to me was he was driving an identical truck to me. And I'm going, I'm going to get two miles down the road, you know, a SWAT helicopter, everything. You know, they're not going to believe me that I'm not the person who just did this thing. But it began to think about it because I caught up with the guy 30 seconds down the road at a stop sign. So it wasn't like he was on the way to the hospital or anything like that. At first, we, we go, he has a problem with school buses. Now, I guarantee you, it's deeper than that. I guarantee you that kind of behavior shows itself in a lot of other areas of his life. That kind of impatience and in arrogance. I guarantee it. And Paul is smart enough to tell us that there's a source to the challenges and the struggles we face. It's not just what we see on the, suffer, on the surface. It's something different. It's deeper. Paul says here in Ephesians, he identifies our enemy, the devil. He tells us that's who it is. Jesus did that for us. In John 8, he called the devil a murderer. He calls the devil a liar. He says he's been lying. He was the father of lies. John said in 1 John that the devil has sinned and has been sinning from the beginning. And Peter tells us that the devil is like a wild animal. He is our enemy. Look at verse 12 again. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the look at that, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Preacher and author Martin Lloyd-Jones warned by writing this. He said, anyone who is not aware of the fight and a conflict in a spiritual sense is in a drugged and hazardous condition. That if we don't think there's a battle that goes on, God not only, identif not only identifies our enemy, he gives us the plan of the enemy. He says there, like in verse 11, he says he calls it the devil's schemes. That's his strategy. The Greek word, and I'm not a Greek scholar by any means, but the Greek word for scheme is the same word that you would use to describe a predator like a lion or a tiger stalking its prey, the scheme that it has. I always remember this story, and I double-checked with Dustin just to make sure I had it right. Some years ago, our youth group went up, uh, I believe somewhere up and around the Raleigh area somewhere, where they have a, a tiger park, and you could go and look at the tigers. And our youth group went, and this was some years ago, because I remember Caden and Hunter, uh, uh, Hunter White, was, they were just little. And they were, Dustin said that they were, they were looking at the tigers, and they kind of grew bored of that. So Caden and Hunter just knelt down, turned their backs to the tiger in the cage, and knelt down were playing with some rocks on the ground. And Dustin was just having to be watching. As soon as they made themselves smaller, turned their backs, that tiger went into stealth mode. He just went down into that position we've all seen on, you know, Wild Kingdom and stuff, where he start, and he started creeping across that open, and then pounced at the fence. And I don't know if he, the tiger thought that he could get to them, or if it was just that old nature of a tiger, scheming, stalking his prey. But that's how the devil is with us. We are his prey. We are part of his scheme. He has a plan. He wants to a desire to destroy. A good rule of thumb is this. If you have something good in your life, the devil's coming after it. If it's something good and holy and righteous and in keeping with God and brings you joy and is something that will be pleasing to God, he's coming after it. He is going to target it. That's the scheme. That's why he said he, that he said he came to kill, steal, and destroy. Someone said this long ago. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. 
But when we have the armor of God and when we want to use what he makes available to us, we do not have to be a battlefield casualty. Now he goes into a section where he tells us in the inventory what we do have available, and that's the spiritual armor that we have. Paul painted a picture for us here of a, of a soldier, particularly a Roman soldier, because that was the soldiers they would have seen of that day. And like we see photos of a soldier ready to go out to battle, or even our police officers when they're on duty and we see the things on their belt and all the things they have and even the bulletproof vests, we're seeing everything they have is for a reason. It has a purpose behind it. It's to make them ready for what is, could come that day or night. Some of the things he mentioned, he says, the belt of truth. The Roman soldier, and I've read scholars and they, it, it, writers it's one of two ways. They say the belt that a soldier wore was there, a belt, and the long flowing robes they could take, and they would tuck in to the belt so that they had to move about quickly and fighting. They didn't get tangled up in that, and that, that very well could be true. But others write about the belt that a Roman soldier wears. It'd be a belt, but then it had like an apron, and you've seen the pictures of that, either the thick, thick, thick leather that protected their midsection from any type of attack. So those, and he compares that, he says, comparing that to truth, how it defends us, how it, it, it is a weapon that we use. I love that I overlooked this for so many years, but Jesus was discussing that he was the Messiah with a group of Jewish people, and it comes to a point where they just will not listen to him, and Jesus says, is there something wrong with my language that you can't understand what I'm proving to you here? But with the truth, the truth like, it just makes those attacks on us not work. We, we understand the truth, and Satan's scheme is to confuse lies and truth together. That's his strategy. He doesn't have the truth. It's the only thing he can do. This verse of scripture from 2 Corinthians 10 is so powerful. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Let's let that sink in for a minute. How beautiful and powerful that is. That the truth that we possess through the word of God and through a relationship with God. It says we take captive. We demolish the arguments of the world. We have the truth. And that's how we, that's how we defend ourselves. He mentions the breastplate of righteousness. And all of us can recognize the uh, the, the breastplate that a soldier would wear, the, 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 metal, the thin metal or thick, thick leather that they would wear that would stop the arrows. We see the, we see the value of that. And on the spiritual side, he calls it uh, the breastplate of righteousness. You know, righteousness, when you read it in the Bible, is usually mentioned in two ways. And uh, I didn't come up with these, these phrases, but one is, is, is imputed righteousness. In other words, righteousness that is input or, or given to us for instance second corinthians 5 21 says god made him talking about jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of god jesus inputting what jesus did makes us righteous makes us right with god that's Im imputed righteousness but there's another type and it's probably what paul is talking about here and you can call that practiced righteousness or here's a word you might probably use more obedience long obedience the protection that comes in our lives by simply being obedient to god moral behavior Eugene Peterson said, Long obedience in the same direction protects our hearts from Satan's attacks. When we are faithful to obey God's commands, 
we eliminate many of the opportunities the devil has to trip us up. Makes, it, makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I remember that point in your life that we've all been when you knew everything. Teenager, you know what I'm talking about. When I was a teenager and getting old enough that I could go out and do stuff with my friends, and I would want to stay out. I wasn't doing anything wrong, doing anything bad. I would just want to be with my friends. And I remember my mom would say it every time. There's nothing good that happens at 2 a.m., you know. And she was right. Just the fact, just the fact to keep me out of those situations was half of the battle. And what he says here is that by obedience or practice righteousness, it keeps us out of those temptations. You know, and writers say, and if we read these things and try to understand them, the weapons that have been mentioned here, uh, all of them are defensive or protection-oriented except for one, the sword. That's what he says in verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Most of the time, when we try to connect the Greek to what we read in the English when the word, uh, the word word is used, it's logos. We, we, we say that, we hear that. Logos means the written word. But here, the Greek word is used as not logos, it's rhema, R-H-E-M-A. And what that means is the spoken word. For instance, when you read the Bible, if you look back at the Greek, when it's the, 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 the story when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted and he would answer the devil with Scripture, it's used rhema or rhema, the spoken word. So we apply that to how we're living, how it's a part of our, uh, a part of our armor of God. It's learning Scripture and being able to say it at the right time and the right way. We speak. We speak the word of God. You know, the number one thing that I hear from people, they'll say, I want to talk to so-and-so, my friend. I want to talk about, about this, this sin that's going on in their life. Or I want to talk to them about their salvation. I want to talk to them, invite them to church. But I'm afraid they will ask me a question I don't know the answer to. Been there, right? That is the number one thing we hear. But when we use, we use the truth, when we use the word, the rhema, the spoken word of God, and we're able to speak those words, we learn enough that we can give those answers. That's a, that is a tool, that is a weapon that we use. Now, just time keeps me from going through everything here, but there's one more thing I want to mention. And that's after we've taken the inventory and we've, we see what's it, we know what the devil, who he is, we know what he's doing, we know the weapons. It's just to rely, to use the armor of God. Use them. Truth, how it, how it defends our lives. Righteousness, obedient living, the gospel, the peace that comes from that. Salvation, the word of God. Probably no one in the Christian faith was more targeted and attacked than the Apostle Paul. If you just want to read a short a, a list, a summary of what he endured for being a Christian, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and just read the things that Paul had to go through simply because he wanted to tell people about Jesus Christ. But he not only survived all of these things, he thrived through all of these things. He relied on the Word of God. He relied on the armor of God and all these things. And he talks about those, and you see them present in his life. But there's one thing that we, we don't need to overlook. He, along the way, if you, read, if you just read all through his writings, he mentions people. He mentions people by name who meant something to him who were there by his side, who helped him, encouraged him, who financed him, all these things. He mentions people like Timothy and Titus and Priscilla, Aquila, 
Philemon, Barnabas, Mark, John. He had the weapons, the armor of God that Paul listed that God had given him. But he goes and mentions people as well. Let me go back to one of the tools I went over very quickly, the the weapon. And that's the shield of faith. A shield was a protection from the attacks of the enemy. You know, we, we, if I went into battle in this, this kind of, kind of uh, battle and fighting of that day, I'd want a shield that would stop the weapons of the other person. And that's what you think about a shield in an individual way. Every person had a shield. But the Romans, they carried it to another level. They designed their shields to where their shield not only protected them, but when they worked as a unit, it protected everyone. And this, this I guess it's in the Latin, when they would, this actually was called, it, what we would use the word turtle. The formation. It put this hard shell all around by using your shield and the person behind you to put their shield above. And they could go into an, a battle and attack, and if they were shooting arrows down from a wall or a higher ground, they went into this formation and just kept moving forward. But they were protected in doing that. So they turned a defensive weapon into an offensive weapon. As a group, they were more powerful than they were individuals. And here's what I want to make, the point I want to make. The church becomes an essential part of the armor of God. Just like like Paul pointed out to us, he names these people by name, who have been there and helped him all along the way. That the church becomes part of the armor of God. That we do not stand alone. We stand together. Now, I know some of you have voiced this, who have who've come from, uh, maybe left from other churches that we're not doing this and we're looking for this. We make a promise to you. We, we make a vow, a commitment to you as elders as ministers that we're going to preach the gospel we're going to teach what's in the bible we're not going to be perfect along the way as we do it but we're going to remain true to the word of god we make you that promise we're not going to change with the with the tides and the cultures it changes we're going to go by the book but you check us on it okay You read the Bible yourself. You check us on that and keep us straight. That's part of what the church does for us. Is that we can be together. We encourage each other. We study together. You're in your Sunday school classes together. You're in the Wednesday night group together. You do things together. And it's encouraging and strengthening and and, and just helping each other along the way. It's a place of accountability. Where if you're missing... That somebody can check on you. And that's what's the beauty of getting involved in smaller groups than this. A Sunday school class or whatever that you can say, hey, I'm missing so-and-so. Or if we see and hear that they're doing things that we know is not in keeping with the book, we can go to them and say, hey, we're worried about you. What's happening? That's the power of the church. That's, That's a piece of the armor in itself. So, of course, our answer, or my question is this to all of us. Are you taking advantage of the armor of God? Have you taken inventory of just what's available to us to fight this battle? And secondly, are you using the church as part of that? That we'll help each other along the way. That we'll shield each other through those things.